Well, g'day. G'day, one and all. My name's Dwayne. You're listening to The Sirens of Audio, the uh, only Doctor Who podcast where you can't sing a rainbow because you have to listen with your ears. Sorry, guys. Too many, too many dad jokes, too many dad puns. Going stir crazy here, just like the rest of the entire planet. How are you going? You going okay? I hope so. Uh, hopefully for the next half an hour or so, we'll be able to give you a little bit of entertainment on news and discussion about the Doctor Who audio universe. From Big Finish, we're going to be talking about this month's release, Cry of the Vulturous, starring the Sixth Doctor, played by Colin Baker, with Miranda Raisin as Constance Clark, and Lisa Greenwood as Flip Ramon. Not only that, we're going to be talking with director John Ainsworth, one of the long-term members of the Big Finish family. But in the most recent Big Finish news, the Time War set Susan's War has dropped. And not only am I excited because it's introducing Susan Foreman to the Time War, but it is also introducing William Russell to the Time War as Ian Chesterton, an elderly Ian Chesterton. So that is a very exciting release. I haven't heard it yet, but it has only dropped in the last few days before the uh, time of this recording. So yeah, grab yourself a copy of that. All the Time War box sets are absolutely fantastic. And you know, I'm going to say that, you know, I'm Mr. Positive around here. I need someone with a bit, bit of negativity to balance me out. I'm just too positive. Um, so let's have a little listen to a trailer for Cry of the Vultress. And then we're going to get straight into our chat with John Ainsworth. How's that sound? From Big Finish Productions, Doctor Who, Cry of the Vultress. Doctor! What the hell's going on? Flip! Grab onto the console! Oh, oh, are we in from a pillar landing? What is it? Time turbulence? We've been ejected from the space-time vortex! It seems the attack on the Parliament building may have been a ruse. During the chaos, Station One was attacked, its guards murdered, and its crystal was stolen. One of the three great crystals is gone. It's not seen us yet. Move back very slowly. This is Constance, a human from the planet Earth. Never heard of it. And if I was still the queen of the Vultress, none of us ever would. I'm sorry if my arrival's not welcome. It wasn't me who invited you. It was that traitor, Skye. Wow, there's bad people now. Oh, no. Lizard people. No, 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 no. Doctor? Who are they? Shh. They're ice warriors. Armoured and heavily armed. Open fire. Big Finish. We love stories. Okay, so this month's monthly range release is Cry of the Vultress, and I'm here to talk about it with director John Ainsworth. Thanks for joining me, John. My pleasure. Thank you for having me. Now, this this one is the first in uh, of a trilogy featuring the Six Doctor, Flip, and Constance. Uh, what I like about this one, it's a nice, linear, classic style story. It's it's a welcome breather. This style of story sometimes from some of the more complex stories that you've got out there. Would you agree with that? I think when I was given the six doctor uh, stories to do for the main range or the monthly range uh, although we call them trilogies and and certainly some of them in the past have been done like trilogies i was very aware now there's an awful lot of box sets that were, that big finish are doing like the time war and things very much have ongoing stories that all link to each other so i thought there was actually now really a place for more traditional self-contained stories if you see what i mean um you know, I, I, I think people like story arcs, but I think it's good to have a variety of both. So certainly these three are all 
completely unconnected in terms of story wise i mean the only uh, thread between them is is the doctor and the companions and um i i think people find that you know refreshing or easy easy to access basically now this is written by by darren jones is this his first script outside of the destiny of the doctor range i've worked with darren before a lot for the bbc audio range he's written quite a lot of uh stories for them and the, these these are basically prose short stories which are then spoken by one one actor and the destiny of the doctor story that he wrote was sort of an extension of that even though we actually had two voices for for the one he did the 10th doctor story he did but this is his first full script uh for big finish i mean he's very experienced um outside of big finish he he writes scripts uh for animation children's series and he's done a huge amount of that uh so he's he's quite um quite used to writing scripts so you know i i, I was completely confident that he would um, deliver something that was good and exciting yeah so i hope you use him again because i absolutely loved this script it was it was uh really really enjoyable i it, i so i often listen uh to part stories but this one i just listened right through from start to finish and i i, I couldn't stop it was fantastic any more plans to use darren again uh, potentially i mean there's nothing actually in the works directly at the moment um he's possibly doing another thing for bbc audio uh, which i'll be working on him with but not for big finishers yet um but yeah i'd certainly happily um invite him to to, to to do another one in the future excellent excellent now there's a lot of standouts in this story um you can probably tell that i like it a lot um but for me personally the standout for me was simon powers sound design it's absolutely sensational you listen to this one with the headphones on you are actually transported to this alien world it's absolutely beautiful he seems reasonably new to big finish hasn't got a a, a lot of projects under his belt for big finish um will you be using simon again and what was your what was your opinion of his work I, yes i think simon did a phenomenal job on uh, on on this story um the music as well not just the sound design the sound design is really quite demanding there's it's quite an action heavy story on an alien world so there's you know alien bird creatures um and the ice warriors particularly that attack on the uh, the rebel camp um halfway through the story that was quite um demanding you know in terms of what was what was needed to convey that and i think his music is just excellent as well um i have used simon quite a lot not not he has done other doctor who's um but he mainly well i first for big finish worked with him on the pathfinder legends range um which is all if you haven't heard that very much sort of sword and sorcery lord of the rings lots of sword fights and dragons and monsters so again very demanding and um i don't think simon had done anything quite like that when we first started working on that but um he he quickly rose to the challenge and uh uh is very good at it and then uh i've also done the blake seven range for big finish and simon's done quite a few episodes of uh blake seven including the 40th anniversary story we did um so yes and now he started doing some some doctor who's as well um i i think he's uh, amazing so yeah I, i'm very happy happy to work with him on any production now in the story the the chemistry between the doctor and the companions is 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 very evident on the finished product what's that like in the studio oh yeah they i mean it's interesting on these ones i i hadn't um worked uh worked with Miranda and Lisa before I mean I well actually having said that I had worked with Miranda but on a non-Doctor Who project we'd, we'd done a, an audio book um, and I'd met Lisa so I sort of knew them um, and but they hadn't actually done a Doctor Who for quite a while it must have been at least 18 months if not two years um, but as soon as they were in studio you could tell they just sort of clicked all back into it and uh, knew how to work with each other uh, which you often see with you know doctor companion pairings once once they've done a few stories they find each other's rhythms and know how to respond to each other so yeah they they get on very well and they're such different characters as well which i think is a uh a nice contrast and we and we actually make more of that in in the next story uh, to come out um but yeah they work really well cool uh, you're you're credited as director which is the the hat you're wearing when i'm talking to you now but you're also producer and script yes. editor um, yes. <laughs> <laughs> um does is it difficult to wear so many hats or does that actually make the process easier in some ways in some ways it makes it easier 
uh, because all these things sort of bleed into each other. Um, I mean, I suppose what you do miss, which is probably a healthy thing to have, is is an outside voice, uh, you know, coming at it with from a different point of view. And I suppose I get that from the writer themselves. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I, I suppose I'm quite used to working like that. I, I did ve more or less did work like that on Pathfinders. I certainly did like did it like that on Blake Seven. Um, so I'm just quite used to it, really. Um, but yes, it, it wouldn't be a bad idea to have someone else chipping in as well. I mean, actually, you know, we, I, uh, the third one of this trilogy, the Lovecraft Invasion, Scott Hancock is actually the direct director on that one. So you know, I don't completely take over all, all the time. No. <laughs> <laughs> no, very good. So, what what are the um, responsibilities responsibilities in those various roles in the production? What does the producer do? What's the director do? What's the script editor do exactly? Well, if if the roles are all completely split up, um, the producer is responsible for the series as a whole, um, and also takes on the duties of things like uh, y y arranging the dates for the regular cast and booking the studios. Um, liaising with agents and contracts and things like that where whereas the director if that's all they're doing really can just focus on the script they will do the casting um, of the of the guest roles but sometimes in liaison with the producer um, and the script editor I mean the script editor comes first really in that uh, they will have worked with the writer to you know, you go through several drafts of a script and uh, and eventually sort of you know arrive at what they consider to be the final script and that will then be given to the producer the producer might then have a, a few more little notes but hopefully you know the idea is that the script will be at a, at a stage where it's if not actually finished it's virtually finished um uh, so yeah but everyone talks to each other and has thoughts and opinions um that feed into the final product cool so the the next um, story that's coming along is called Scorched Earth. I noticed I, I wrote a movie treatment years ago called Scorched Earth. I hope uh, it's not plagiarised uh, at all. <laughs> I hope not. <laughs> I, think, I think it's a it's a it's a common title. I think. Um, yeah. I want to go back just for a second, right back to the start of your time with with Big Finish. Take a trip down memory lane. I noticed sure. that your first job, if if I'm correct, if the chronology is correct on the website, was not in a behind-the-scenes role, it was as an actor. Oh, technically. Is this for Fearmonger? Yeah, that's it. I think I had one line or something, <laughs> and I just happened to be in the studio, and Gary Russell said, say that. I don't even remember what it was. Do you, have you got it in front of you? What did I play? <laughs> I haven't. I haven't got it in front of me, no. I, I it was, it was I a radio no announcer, I think, of, of some Oh, it could well have been. Yeah. Yeah, I'm always getting to do tannoys and things like that so yeah i think i must have just been i remember being in the studio um and i think gary must have just said oh john can do this and i did it and i think there was another one i played i think i played time lord number four or something in, in one of the gallery episodes as well so i mean i wouldn't i wouldn't consider these to be really acting roles you know it's not like i was sort of uh given a script and a proper part and i certainly wasn't paid for them um so yeah i i don't think they really count I don't put them on my CV. So. <laughs> so how so how did you start with Big Finish? What was what was the story behind that for you? Well, like like Nick Briggs and Gary Russell, I was involved in the audiovisuals amateur audios, which I'm sure you've heard of, mm -hmm. um, which we did in the eighties. I mean, it was sort of at the same time that Colin and Sylvester were being the doctors. And we just did our own little audio adventures, which we released on cassette and, and sold at conventions and things like that. Um, and they started off being quite amateurish. And by the end of it, we did something like 28 separate stories. And by the end of it, they were pretty good, you know, sort of on a par with, with big finished stories, really, in terms of quality of production and script and things. Um, so I'd been involved in that. And... Then later on, after Big Finish had begun, uh, and Gary and Nick were working on it, um, Gary, well, I actually started doing the website. I did the original Big Finish, not the original Big Finish. I took over the original Big Finish website and just sort of maintained that for a while. Um, and then 
yes, what happened was I directed a stage play uh, at a fringe festival in Brighton um, with Jacqueline Pierce uh, in it, and everyone from Big Finish came to see it, and um, they seemed to like it. And Jason Hay Galloway, who runs Big Finish, said, "You should be working for us. You should be directing for us." And as a result of that, almost immediately, I was offered a Bernice Summerfield audio called The Plague Herds of Excellis, which was the fourth part in a trilogy, <laughs> as they called it. Um, Great trilogy, too. And it was Katie Manning. Uh, it was the first thing Katie Manning had done for Big Finish, the first Iris Wild Time. It, it wasn't the first to be released, but it was the first she recorded. Um, so she came along and gave her Iris Wild Time. Um, and uh, which is quite it's quite uh it's quite a big performance as i'm sure you know. oh yeah <laughs> uh and uh and i remember when she she did that uh that was in the morning of the, the day of recording and gary wasn't there gary russell and he'd worked out this with her what she was going to do for i was wild time and so I just let her do her thing. And then he, when he came in at lunchtime, I said, OK, listen to this scene. And he listened to her, I said, is that what you wanted her to be like? And he said, yes. And I said, that's fine then. And we <laughs> carried on. So, But yeah, that was, yes, I was I was quite uh, sort of slightly surprised that they gave me what seemed to be quite an important thing to begin with, if you see what I mean. I mean, the fact that it was Katie and uh, Iris Wilder. I mean, I suppose Gary just trusted me to do it, which is very nice of him. And um it, it, yes, it was it was enjoyable, and um, I think it turned out okay. And Katie was living in Australia at the time, so it probably probably would have been working around schedules and things like that, pretty tight schedules. I guess it must have been. Yes, I. She must have just come over for a convention, or I think she did went through a period where she was sort of alternating back and forth from the UK. Um, I don't know. I, mean, I didn't. I don't think I really got involved in that. I, I was just told. I mean, this is an example of producer and director. I was just the director and the producer, Gary, just said, right, we're recording this on this day with Katie Manning. Uh, can you do it? And I said, yes. So I, I, I didn't have to worry about where Katie was in the world, basically. And I bet you didn't even have to think about it. <laughs> no, I didn't until today. Yeah. <laughs> you would have said yes immediately. Um, oh yeah! Oh yes, I see. Yes, no, I definitely. I, I was delighted to do it. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, I want to pick an obscure production that you worked on for uh, for Big oh, Finish, yeah. one that I really love, and I still love digging it out from time to time and having a listen to it. To it, and that's um, Strontium Dog. I really, uh, particularly down to earth. There's um, some scenes yes. in there with Nick Briggs um, as Six Squid, who it just cracks right. cracks me up every time. Hey there, handsome. I guess you came in off the red eye. Yeah, I get that a lot. Oh, sorry. What can I get you? I'm looking for someone. Might have come in on the 602. There's a CC desk outside. It shoots every face that comes through. Yeah, it's broken. I'm looking for a really big guy with a white fur cape, long blonde hair and a giant bushy beard. Might be cuffed or something in custody, possibly sedated. You couldn't miss him. If he came through here... Look around, pal. Just snoozy in the corner there and the goldfish. Yeah. How about a short pink guy called Six Squid? Face like a box of frogs, can't go ten minutes without water. Sounds familiar. Who wants to know? I'm a bounty hunter. Oh, a strontium dog. You gonna cut me in on the bounty for this squid guy? There's no bounty yet. He kidnapped my partner. Sounds like you need the police. I was hoping to settle this out of court. <laughs> <laughs> sure you were, Alpha. Squid, get out from behind there. You two know each other? <laughs> yeah, you look kind of thin without your armour, Johnny. What have you done with Wolf? What do you think I did with him, Alphabet Boy? I turned him in. He's innocent. Oh, everybody's innocent, Johnny. No, Squid, he's really innocent. <laughs> Cool. Easy now. Do I hear violin? Didn't you check first, you <laughs> moron? Yeah, definitely violin. Deal with it, Alpha. Your buddy is toast and I sent him down. You do the same for me. Sent him down? Where? Well, he's being collected now. I'm waiting for the call. Then I get my money. Wolf hasn't done anything. I'll give it a rest, Johnny. Someone's paying for delivery. I'm just doing my job here. Your job is bringing in bail jumpers and criminal squid, not kidnapping. Blow it out, you spinter. <laughs> Miss? Yeah? Does this belong to anybody? The whiskey? There's hardly any left in the bottle. 
Let me no, give this'll it... do fine. I'll take it. Do you want another glass with that, or...? Ah! Where's Wolf? <laughs> Let go! Where's Wolf? I'm not screwing around! Oh, my <laughs> God! What's that black stuff? It's only ink. I'm leaking. Now, I leak when I get nervous. Oh, not in my bar, you don't. I'll show you leaking, Squid. Take it outside, you two. I'm going to slice you a new one if you don't tell me where Wolf is. I don't know. Mister, put that fishy guy down or I'm calling the cops. Yeah. You're a head case, Alpha. I want some answers, Squid. Do you have any memories of, of that... Uh production those couple of productions and working with simon pig yes I, we did we did three with simon and i directed the first one and the third one um nick biggs directed the second one um yeah i don't remember it in a lot of detail um it was great to meet simon he, he was uh, i think he was quite enthusiastic to uh, be doing it he was very complimentary about the script in fact he was always complimentary about all of the scripts you know and by the time we were doing the third one he'd already you know was doing his movies and everything so it, it was good that he sort of made time for us really um but i think he he liked he liked the comics you know the strong comics and which is why we we knew i think jason haig elevated there was a, a joke in spaced about uh one of the characters knew where they were when Johnny Alpha died or something. And from that, Jason Hegelary extrapolated that Simon must be a fan of Strontium Dog. So therefore, we had a good chance of getting him if we asked him to come and play the role. And he was absolutely right. And, 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 and that, that's what happened, really. So, um, yeah, I, it, I remember it just going really well and, and Simon being good fun to work with. And, and Toby Longworth was one of the regulars in the Big Finish production team at that time and absolutely brilliant voice artist. Uh, I remember there was yes. there was one, I don't know if you worked on it, but he did a Judge Dredd called Solo where he did all these different voices throughout the production. It was just incredible. Yes. Very talented. That was just, just me and Toby by that time. Oh, um, that was you? Uh, uh, well, directing it, yeah, yes. Yeah. Um, uh, yes, by that, I mean, I produced the whole of the 2000 AD range and but by I directed I didn't direct a lot of the earlier ones um, but the, the later ones I think the last six or so we did and actually I mean that final one that Toby had suggested to me quite some time before that he would love the idea of just doing one where you did all the voices and for the last six judge threats the budget the budget was extremely tight and so of course toby's suggestion was uh, a very economical way of, of doing it i only had one actor to pay for basically um so that was one of the reasons for going for that uh, and of course he did it really well as as well and uh, and and it was a clever script as well i think that that worked really well so um yeah that was a, a good way to finish the, the the full cast ones anyway yeah yeah oh, i also noticed that you were involved in the in at least the first box set of Jago and Lightfoot too. I, I'm I can't remember if you're in any re, involved in any of the other ones, but um... no, I directed one episode, and I think I'm probably the only other person besides Lisa Barman to direct it. I think she probably did everything else. I think I was going to say um, I, th I was very surprised. I thought that was her baby, um, but then I saw your name on the first one. I think the reason was because this was quite a, it was the first box set, wasn't it? Yeah. So yeah. I think the I think I think the reasoning behind it was it was an episode because she also played one of the characters. I can't remember the name of the character. Ellie, I think um, it is. That's right. And I think the episode that I directed was a, a, an episode that Ellie was quite heavily in. You know, she was in a lot of scenes. So I think the thinking was that rather than her have to direct and act. Um, they get someone else to direct it. So I was asked to do just that one, basically, um, which was great. And it was lovely to work with all of them. Um, and Janet Henfrey, I think it is, uh, was in it um, as the um, the lady who did the seance. I remember that. Um, but yeah, that, that's been my only involvement with Jago and Lightfoot, but I'm pleased to have done it. So, yeah. Yeah. Now, you, you mentioned that you're involved with Blake Seven. Now, I'm of the understanding that um, before Paul Darrow passed away, he was he was quite ill for a number of years, and well, he had to he had to do the recordings from home. Is that right? How, what 
What was the logistics knock, behind that? Knock, well, he wasn't he wasn't ill in the sense of a an ongoing daily basis. I mean, he um, he had been ill, and as a result, had basically had to have both his legs amputated. Um, so he was in a wheelchair. So it was more from a practical consideration that you know getting him to come to London or, or somewhere down because he lived he lived by this time he lived uh, uh, just outside of Birmingham in the Midlands. Um, so it would be quite uh, you know a difficult thing for him to, to, to travel to the recording studios. So what we arrived at was just I I, I discovered uh, a little recording studio just 15 minutes away from where he lived. Um, and we just got into this habit where I would travel up to uh, Birmingham and record with him for a day and we'd record all his scenes for usually four episodes at a time or three or four. Uh, and um, and then we would just edit him in to w w with all the other actors who were recorded in London, basically. So, But for most of the time, he wasn't really ill in the sense that, um, you know, he was struggling or life was difficult it was really only the last recording when which we, we recorded his scenes for the last ones just a week before he died actually i mean obviously i didn't know he was so ill um but but he he, he was having a bit of a difficult time on that day and you know we did i did give him the option to say we well, don't have to do this we can stop but he was absolutely insistent of carrying on i think he just wanted to to get it done really uh, and he enjoyed doing it you know so yeah that was all very sad but um i feel very fortunate to have worked with him and it's a, a great legacy that he's left behind but particularly in the blake seven universe too so absolutely fantastic yeah. that he was able to do all that for 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 the fans absolutely yeah. yes no i'm very pleased with the blake sevens and um and that we had the 40th anniversary you know and we got all Virtually all the surviving cast were in that for the anniversary story. So, uh, yeah, I, I'm quite proud of the Blake Sevens I've, I've done. Have you got any other standout memories from your time in Big Finish? We could talk about your productions. You've got hundreds of productions that pop up uh, <laughs> when you do a search under <laughs> your name. But uh, any p particular standouts that we that we haven't mentioned so far? Well, I enjoyed I enjoyed doing the Doctor Who Unbound stories. Um, I particularly liked we did after the main the first six that we did we did a follow-up well there were several follow-ups but um the one that i'm particularly pleased with was called a storm of angels which was uh with jeffrey belden as a sort of first doctor uh, and carol Ann ford uh and they'd got on really well the in the first story they'd done old mortality which was the first one of them of the main batch of unbounds um so that one was particularly uh, i was particularly pleased with how that turned out it was quite epic and very demanding in terms of sound design and music and uh, i i, I love that one um i don't often go back and listen to things i've worked on but that is one that i've occasionally had a, a had a little listen to or at least part of it because uh, I, I i do like it so much and it was great that Geoffrey Bolden had had that part to play because obviously many of us know he was considered for the first Doctor, wasn't he? Apparently, yes, but I didn't know that until he was in studio. You know, I we uh, I knew that he had been talked about as a sort of fan favourite, um, but he, but that was much later. This was during Tom Baker's time. I think he was, you know. Uh, fans would sort of say oh Jeffrey Belden would be a good candidate to take over even when Tom Baker leaves you know so I think that's where my thinking of casting him came from in the first place and then to discover that he'd actually been considered for it um, you know at the very beginning I was I was amazed about that so yeah. Uh, we Speaking of Unbound we probably should mention Full Fathom 5 since um, David Collings just passed away in the last couple yes. of weeks. Yes. Yeah, that, that was, was a brilliant, sad. brilliant yeah. audio play. Uh, that's my favourite one of the series. <laughs> um, but yeah, uh, another another actor who had an amazing contribution to the Doctor Who universe and sorry to see him go as yeah. well. Welcome to the Deep Sea Energy Exploration Project, General Flint. You won't regret coming here. I hope not, Professor Vollmer. So, this is the DEEP that eats so much of my R&D budget, huh? That whole area of the seabed will still be contaminated by radiation. 
even after nearly 30 years. If it's so dangerous, why are you going? I'm going for you, Ruth. I shared my hopes and fears with you, things I couldn't tell anyone else. And this is how you repay me, with betrayal, going behind my back, diverting money from my funding for this, this freak show. Oh my god, it's a baby! <laughs> This place. It's a horror show. An <laughs> exhibition of atrocities, all in the name of science. Oh, you're not going to the seabed in that rust bucket, are you? Hey! My Neptune is the fastest commercial mini sub on this coast. The Neptune? <laughs> How original. Wouldn't the Titanic be more appropriate? Uh, have you ever uh, thought of taking up smuggling, Doctor? If I told you, I'd have to kill you. Who the hell are you? Smith. Dr. John Smith. But everyone just calls me the Doctor. I've come to save the day. Yes, David was excellent. I didn't actually direct that one, but I was I was there on the day that we did it, and I think I think I cast him. Um, and again, it was for very very similar reasons as for uh, Jeffrey Belden, in that um, David had been talked about as someone who could, you know, possibly be the Doctor in the eighties at some point, um, and and of course it had never happened. Um, so and and you know he 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 had some. Uh, you know, people were very familiar with him from Sapphire and Steel, particularly. I mean, of course, he's done a great deal more than all all of that. Um, but yeah, he was a very good actor, and uh, and I think he did the part really well. Full Fathom Five is sort of my favourite of the Unbounds in many ways, in in the sense that I think it it did the it did what we wanted to do with the Unbounds. It really sort of twisted it, and so rather than twist the story or the plot, we twisted the character of the Doctor and. And the plot itself was actually very traditional in, in many ways. And it was just the Doctor that was different. Um, it was very controversial at the time. There was people got quite annoyed and upset about it that we, you know, had the Doctor effectively being a murderer uh, and, and deceiving his companion. And there were some people who said, oh, I bought this, but I'm not going to listen to it now. I know what it's like. It was, uh, there really? was quite a fuss at the time. Okay. Oh, yeah, there was, <laughs> yeah. Even, I was, I was quite surprised. I thought, you know, if, if we'd done it in this part of the main range, um, you know, and just sort of slipped it in somehow, um, I could almost see that people might be annoyed. But I thought, well, this is Doctor Who Unbound, and we have stated what it's about. You know, what what the what the the idea is with these stories. So the fact that people, even knowing that, were still quite annoyed and upset, um, I was quite taken by surprise. Really, um, I suspect they've got over it now. <laughs> I, I I think that whole script was written completely around that final scene so the final scene was the uh was the first thing that that you must have wanted and then this the script seemed to be written just to lead us to that point right at the end which is a amazing way to end the story i guess so i mean it was i think it was a little bit sort of because you actually do i mean I, the bit that the, the scene that stands in my mind i mean that that the end scene does stand in my mind as well of course but the the, the, the there's a real sort of turning point where i i can't remember where the the, the the doctor's holding a gun on someone and and uh and says don't you believe i'll do this or something and and the other person says no and he just says wrong answer and pulls the trigger and shoots someone and and that's the bit i think we used to think oh my goodness you know <laughs> the doctor has just murdered someone in cold blood so that was the real sort of turning point as far as the audience was concerned because you sort of lulled earlier on you sort of think oh here's a nice this is the doctor being the doctor and he's you know very nice and very true to the spirit of the doctor and then you suddenly get that twist uh, and think oh no this is he's completely different excellent so cry of the vultures is out right now and um there was one more thing that i that i wanted to ask you about and that's nick sure. nick briggs of course is is uh playing an ice lord um you've got the actor yes. who played the empress from the tv series um reprising no not the same role but she's a similar role Yes, uh, Adele Lynch. Yep, that's yep. right. I, I, and obviously, we deliberately cast her because she played the Ice Queen in the Queen of Mars. I think it's called the, the it's e Empress of Mars, isn't it? Empress of Mars. I beg your pardon. Um, yes. Uh, and as we had this part, you know, in, in the story, I thought, well, 
almost a bit like you know Alan Bennion used to play all the Ice Lords in the original series. I thought, well, we could almost do the same here, and you know Adele Lynch should play all the Ice Queens or Ice Empresses or whatever. Uh, anyway, so yes, she came back. Um, was very pleased to do it, and she sounds great. Uh, and I think it's great to have another, you know, uh, female Ice 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 Warrior or Ice Lady or whatever you want to call them. So yeah. And the challenge is out there to spot Nick Briggs's appearances in his uh, minor cameo roles throughout the story as well. <laughs> yeah, there are a few. Yes, <laughs> yes. He's <laughs> got one of those voices that we all know so well now. <laughs> I know. Yes, you'll pick it out. <laughs> all right, John Ainsworth, it's been a, a real pleasure having a chat with you um, about this month's release and some of your other work. Thank you very much for, for joining me. Thank you very much for having me. It's been great to talk about it all. All right, there you go. That's it for another instalment of The Sirens of Audio. I truly hope that you have enjoyed uh, the episode and you've got something potentially new out of it. I did. I wasn't aware that John Ainsworth was part of the audio visuals team from way back in the 80s. There you go. I learned something new. But thanks, John. That was really good to have you on. Really appreciate that. If you want to contact me, you can do so at uh, sirensofaudio at gmail.com on the email. On Twitter, you can contact me at Audio Sirens. You can follow us on the website, sirensofaudio.com. Uh, we've also got a Facebook group. I encourage you to jump along there and join. Just do a search for the Sirens of Audio. You'll find it. It's a public group. Shouldn't be too hard to find. And if you want to leave some audio feedback, because after all, this is a show about audio, head over to anchor.fm slash sirens of audio. You can leave up to 60 seconds of audio feedback on this or any other audio adventure that you would like to share some insights about, and I will fit it into the podcast. Trust me. You can trust me on this. I will. Until next time, remember to listen to audio drama because audio drama raw. raw.